Okay, so today is our final atomic physics review lesson. We're going to go over a little sample of everything that we've done in this whole unit. We're not going to be able to hit every single outcome, but I do want to do what I think is some of the more important kinds of questions that you can anticipate on your unit exam. Anyway, let's get going here. Uh, so the concepts we've learned include Thompson's experiment, which is deflecting cathode rays, Millikan's oil drop experiment, which is determining charge to mass ratio, absorption and emission spectra, which is electron energy levels, whether they're being absorbed or emitted, uh, the Frank Hertz experiment, which showed matter can also have a wavelength, uh, mass spectrometers, which determine isotopes, that's where Fe equals Fm in the first stage to select a velocity, and then Fm equals Fc, that's where you actually determine what isotope it is based on the mass. Uh, radioactive decay, which is alpha, beta, and gamma, half-life, nuclear fission and fusion reactions, including the energy released. Uh, that, of course, just comes out of, you know, how the energy just, there's a, there's a mass defect and the energy just changes, of course, into energy. Uh, and then, of course, subatomic particles, particularly quarks. Again, we're not going to cover everything today. We're just going to cover a sample of this. I've got about, uh, I think, like five or so questions to ask you. It's going to be a you try, I go over kind of question or kind of day today. Uh, if you're really not feeling it, though, uh, at least watch to see how I go over these questions and think critically about what I do for each step. But please, I really, I really hope you do give these questions a try because they are really important and good practice. Anyway, let's get going. So first example, an electron is deflected through an arc of radius 3.70 millimeters when it passes through a perpendicular magnetic field of strength 72.0 milliteslas. What is the kinetic energy of the electron? Pause the video here, give this one a try. All right, so I'm gonna go over this one now. Uh, there's a few hints in here as to what kind of formulas we're gonna to have to set up here. Because it says arc of radius this and magnetic field of strength this, that's your cue that we're actually dealing with one of the cases where Fc, because that's an arc, centripetal force has an arc to it, uh, is equal to Fm. Well, the formula for Fc is mv squared over r, and the formula for Fm is qvb, where b, of course, is the magnetic field strength. Notice since there's V on both sides of this, you can actually turn this down even further. It's going to become MV over R equals QB. Uh, and what we're looking for here is the kinetic energy. Well, kinetic energy will come from the velocity. So let's get velocity all by itself by saying V equals QB R over M. And then we can throw in all the numbers that we have here. Q, of course, is your charge. Since it's an electron, it just has an elementary charge of 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19. B is your magnetic field strength 72 milliteslas, that's 0 0.072. I'll put another zero on there for good measure. Uh, that's in Teslas. Uh, and then R is uh, 3.70 millimeters, so that's 0 0.0037 uh, millimeters, right? Or, or sorry, meters is what that is now. Anyway, divide that by mass. Mass, in this case, the mass of your electron, that's on your formula sheet, it's 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31. Uh, and if you throw that in your calculator, you're going to find that V is equal to, and I'm going to keep all my, my, uh, my digits here, 4678144.9. I guess that would be 46,788,144.9 meters per second. We can use this now to find our kinetic energy. Kinetic energy, EK, is one half mv squared. We know the mass, again, it's 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31, and we've determined the velocity, so let's just throw those numbers in there. EK equals 1 half times 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 times V, which is 4678844.9 squared. Throw that in your calculator. Round two, looking at this question, three sig digs, 1.99 times 10 to the negative 15 joules. So that is how much kinetic energy uh, that electron must have had. All right, next question here. In a hydrogen atom, an electron jumps, uh, I should say just jumps from, jumps from the n equals one orbital, orbital to the n equals four orbital. Determine the wavelength of the photon associated with this transition and state whether it was absorbed or emitted. Pause the video here, give this one a try. Okay, so first things first, because we're going from n is one to n is four, that means we're going up this way, right? Uh, that tells you right now that this increase in energy must have come from somewhere. So a photon must have come in and been absorbed. So I'll even circle that right now. It must have been absorbed for that to occur. So we've answered that part of the question, but let's actually now determine the wavelength. Uh, the only way to determine a wavelength of a photon here is the formula E equals HC over lambda. 
lambda, of course, is your wavelength. H is a constant, C is also a constant, it's the speed of light, we're looking for lambda. We need our energy though. The energy in this case is gonna be the difference between those two energy levels. 13.6, or negative 13.6 really, uh, to negative 0 0.850, you can just subtract those numbers. And I just make them positive because it's just easier for my mind to work with. So I just subtract those two numbers to find the difference between the two. Uh, and I get 12.75 electron volts. That's how much energy we have. So since this amount of energy is in electron volts, we should have our H value also be in electron volts. There's two different versions of H on your formula sheet. There's one in electron volts and there's one in joules. So we'll use the electron volts one here. Another thing I'm gonna do though, just to make my life easier, is I'm gonna rearrange this. So times by lambda and divide by E. So lambda equals HC, oops, not EC, HC over E. Uh, and that, that way I can just throw it all in all at once. Anyway, lambda is gonna equal H. We're gonna use the EVH, so that's 4.14 times 10 to the negative 15 times by C, which is 3.0 times 10 to the eight, divided by E, which is just 12.75. And you're gonna find that your wavelength lambda to, uh, I guess to three sig digs, because these are really the only numbers that we used here, uh, is 9.74 times 10 to the negative eight meters. And if you wanna put that in nanometers, that's up to you, but I'll just leave it like this for now. That's totally fine. Don't need to go uh, to more work than we need here. All right, next question. This one goes really quick, actually, as long as you know what you're doing. Uh, write the beta negative decay equation for thorium-234. I'll give you a second to work on this. Just pause the video here. All right, so I'll go over the answer now. Like I said, this one's going to go real quick. You just have to use your periodic table. Thorium-234. Thorium, I just know, is TH. If you didn't know that, you can look at your periodic table. 234 is up here. Something I don't know about thorium is its atomic number. That's the bottom left number here. So you have to look at your periodic table. Uh, that's going to be 90 for thorium. Uh, beta negative decay uh, is where, this is how I always think of it, it's where a neutron becomes a proton because you're starting beta negative, starts with an N, you're starting with a neutron, it's becoming a proton. So that means your proton number has to go up by one, so it's going to have to become 91. Well, if your proton number went up to 91, it's no longer thorium by definition. It's going to be one more than that. So on your periodic table, you'll see that that's, hold on, let me double check, protactinium, protactinium. Wow, okay, so that's Pa, protactinium. Uh, and of course, because a neutron became a proton, your total atomic mass does not actually change, right? You just, you lost a neutron, so it went down by one, but then you gained a proton, so it went back up. So it's 234 up here. Uh, plus, we need to emit our beta negative particle. A beta negative particle is just an electron, but we write it using the beta symbol. Negative one down here, put a zero up here just for good measure. Uh, and an, an electron or a beta negative particle is normal matter. What happens in beta decay is it's always a piece of normal matter and a piece of antimatter that get produced. Since your electron is normal matter, that leads your neutrino to be an antineutrino in this case. So you need to make sure that that is an antineutrino that got formed uh, from this beta negative reaction. That's all there is to it. Uh, took longer than expected because I explained the whole darn thing, but uh, if you're writing it out, it shouldn't take you more than about 20 seconds. Moving on. Frankium-223 has a half-life of 22.0 minutes. Find the remaining amount of Frankium-223 left in a 500 gram sample that's left for two hours. Pause the video here, give this one a try. Okay, so the formula for half-life is N equals N0 times one half to the power of little n. And I have said this a million times now, I hate this formula, but the number one thing I hate about it is the fact that they just put little n up here. That little n stands for the number of times. The number of times, is better thought as being your elapsed time, so how much time has passed, divided by the time of your half-life. So I call it T1 half, okay? Uh, so throwing these numbers in here, uh, just regular capital N here is how much is left over at the end, and N with a zero is how much you started with. So N equals 500 times by one half to the power of little n, the little n, remember, is your elapsed time divided by your half-life. Your half-life is 22 minutes, your time elapsed is two hours. Two hours, of course, is 120 minutes, so we'll just change it so they're in the same unit. They don't have to be in hours. They don't have to be in seconds. They just have to be in the same unit. So that's going to be the power of 120 divided by 22. That sometimes is nice to put in brackets on its own, especially when you put it in your calculator. Bottom line is this question is going to have three sig digs as its answer, so it's 11.4 grams. Whew, done. All right, we've got one more question we're going to do, and this last question is a doozy. Okay, I do want you to give this one a try. Nate finally manages to isolate individual quarks, a feat previously deemed impossible by physicists. 
However, as physicists predicted, isolating individual quarks actually created a corresponding antiquark, which immediately annihilates the isolated quark. Uh, find the energy released in joules from the annihilation of an up quark and an anti up quark. I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to want to use some details that are on your formula sheet, particularly the quote unquote mass of a quark and of an anti quark, of course, an anti up quark. Uh, so find that on your formula sheet. Give this one an honest shot, and I'll go over it in a second. All right, I hope you actually give this one a try. If you weren't able to get it, I don't blame you. It's, it's a pretty tricky one. Uh, if you look on your formula sheet, you're going to see that the mass of both an up quark and an anti-up quark is 2.4 mega electron volts per C squared. This is another way of representing mass. It's a really silly way of representing mass, if you ask me. It just makes it a nicer number for when you deal with these really obscure things. Uh, but in my honest opinion, I think we'd rather turn this into kilograms because mass in kilograms can lead us to an energy in joules. Well, to turn this into kilograms, let's just rethink this. It's 2.4. Um, oh, sorry, before I get there, before I get there, my mistake, there's an up quark and an anti up quark. When they touch together, it's going to turn into energy. So both of their masses are going to combine. 2.4 plus 2.4 is 4.8. So 4.8 mega electron volts over C squared is what's going to happen here. Now, 4.8 mega electron volts. Let's just focus on that numerator there first. That means, I'll just erase it so we save some time, that means it's 4.8 times 10 to the 6 electron volts. Now, electron volts can be turned into joules, okay? So joules can be formed from this just by timesing it by 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19, uh, of course, just on the numerator. Uh, then, of course, we want to divide by c squared. c, as we know, is 3.0 times 10 to the 8, uh, and then we got to square it. Uh, so if you just do that in your calculator, you're going to find the mass in kilograms, because this is all going to cancel out here. The mass in kilograms is going to be 8.533333 times 10 to the negative 30 kilograms. So that is your mass in kilograms. Now, in terms of energy, we got to remember Einstein's famous equation here, E equals mc squared. We can just take this mass and times it by c squared, and we're good to go. So really, it's almost like we could have just found the numerator here, but you know what, it's, it's whatever, it's whatever. Because you see, we divided by c squared, now we got to just times by c squared again. Whatever, whatever, not the end of the world. So uh, just throw it in. So uh, m is 8.533333 times 10 to the negative 30 times by c squared. I'm getting really lazy here. 3.0 times 10 to the 8 squared. E is therefore equal, and with, uh, geez, it didn't even, even, didn't even tell us how many sig digs. You know what, we'll just go to three sig digs just for fun. Uh, three sig digs on this one, we'll just say 7.68 times 10 to the negative 13 joules. So in other words, if two quarks, an, an up quark and an anti-up quark, uh, collided and annihilated each other, that's how much energy uh, would be released. Uh, which again, that sounds like a very small amount of energy, but given how small quarks theoretically are, uh, that is actually pretty big in the whole grand scheme of things. All right, so for practice, uh, just complete any practice questions that are left over in your atomic physics notebooklet. If you feel confident your unit exam by the time you're watching this uh, should be available. I'm making that unit exam available by Wednesday at noon. Uh, and this is our final video lesson. That's it. We're done. Thank goodness. It's all over. Uh, so I want to give a big thank you to those of you that stuck through all during this. And chances are you are watching this right now. Those who didn't stick through are not watching this right now. Uh, you're really going to be thankful for sticking through with this in the long run. If you ever go on to take any physics in university, and believe me, you might surprise yourself. If you think you don't, you won't, but uh, you might, right? Uh, you will be really thankful that you stuck through this in these really weird, challenging times. Anyway, if you need anything from me, you know how to reach me. Uh, best of luck.